universe is expanding faster than ever before. The race is already on to reach the red planet, and there are many other exciting challenges ahead as we explore the very edges of our geographical boundaries and test the limits of what is possible. We've come to the place where science and adventure converge to find out what NASA is doing to physically prepare our astronauts for the journeys ahead. With some special access passes, we're boldly going where no lifter has gone before. It's NASA, baby, and we're taking you along for the ride. Two thousand fifteen was a big year in weightlifting. With new records set in the snatch, clean and jerk, the bar is rising higher and higher for the next generation of lifters. But the competition platform in Houston wasn't the only site for feats once thought impossible. Right down the road, crews at NASA are celebrating a year of breakthroughs and progress. Astronauts sampled the first ever space salad, grown in the world's only orbiting laboratory. This proves that astronauts do in fact eat their greens. And astronaut Scott Kelly kicked off the first one-year mission, breaking records for both total time and cumulative days in space for any NASA astronaut. Right, across one year, yes. Oh, that's like a researcher's dream, right? Yeah. yeah. So they're doing measurements, you know, physiological measurements, psychological measurements, how they look as they age. There's twins in space. How cool is that? Last week we saw some extraordinary things. Maybe not top secret Area 51 crash site artifacts or nothing, but we did learn a ton about the challenges that come with living and training aboard the ISS. You're in a nice little tin can up there for a long time. Everything gets tight, just simply floating around, right? Mike swapped his faithful Aleko barbell for something distinctly more high tech. Yeah, before, I thought I wouldn't want to go to space, but uh, now that I know I can squat up there. <laughs> We saw how cycling works in space without gravity pinning you down to the seat. These aren't the only countermeasures NASA uses in space for preserving strength and fitness. There is also a third. This is our, uh, our treadmill. Uh, it fits in that little box right there. And again, just like with all the other devices, what you're seeing here, this whole frame, this is the vibration system. So this holds it in the pit, it, it, it'll move it moves in all directions. So it moves up and down, side to side, does all kinds of, it just kind of, this you know, is kind a of floating, it's a true free floating treadmill device. Okay, and again, that's to, to absorb the vibrations of the system. So the difference with treadmill in space is you have to be bungee, you have to have a way to be on the treadmill. So this is what we use. We use these things right here. So this is a basic harness, and it's fully adjustable. You can adjust it so that you can put more load through your shoulders or you can put more load through your hips. And then these are clipped into these bungees and that's what loads you down, okay? So there's a couple limitations. One is you can't go below three miles an hour. The fastest you can go is 11.2 miles an hour. And if you're only running at 75% or 80% of your body weight, you can't get there depending on the speed of the interval. You can't get there. And the other limitation is, of course, the load. You're limited not only by the bungees, because the bungees only provide so much load, but you're also limited by once you put the harness on, you're gonna feel it. When we put it on, you're gonna feel the compression. It's, you're running now with, your body weight's not distributed through your body. It's here and here. And it's a comfortable, you know, some people, some people can tolerate it, some people can't tolerate it, you know? And one of the things that we found out is very early on, which again gives us another idea to the, to develop new stuff is that speed is much more important than load. So the ground reaction forces that we're seeing don't even come close to the ground reaction forces you would see running in a 1G environment. Mm -hmm. 
the closest we can get to it is the faster you run, the faster we can get those loads to. Um, so load's not necessarily the important part factor, it's the speed, which works great into what we believe anyway, which is we want to do intervals anyway, so we want the speed, right? right? Anyway, so Lauren, we get one of you guys hooked up and let you play with it a little bit. I'll show you some stuff. Later. As Mike suits up and has a go on the treadmill, you can immediately see the bungee and force absorption system kick in the action. It's these ground reaction forces that help sustain the bone health of crew members during long missions. One in three people worldwide suffer from osteoporosis and the consequences of low quality bone mass. And while they may never experience life in space, the training research conducted here is supporting the treatment and prevention of bone related disease and wasting on Earth. As we learned with the cycle, the biggest training return doesn't come from long, slow sessions. A few max effort sprints work just fine. We can rebuild muscle fairly quickly. We can rebuild, rebuild the VO2 fairly quickly. It's the bone density that takes a lot of time to get back. It was taking crew two, two and a half years to get bone dense, mental density back. Wow. So we're, we're doing a lot better than we are now with that, but I mean, it's a long time. So you don't even know if it remodels exactly the same way. It can remodel differently. And we're just now getting into what we call QCT type of scanning, where it's three-dimensional scanning, where they can look at both types of bone, cortical and trabecular, and, def and decide which way, which, what's losing, the structure, the mat, what's, what's yeah, causing it. Data. Yeah. And then is, does exercise, does that type of bone respond to different types of exercise than the other bone? So maybe we're training completely wrong. Maybe we have to train a different way to hit this particular type of bone, right? We don't know yeah. yet. So those are some of the things we're looking at. Rate of force development is is potentially even more important than just physical loading. Yes. Um, do you guys have any way to do any, any fast loading or is that, well, or especially like deceleration? Well, we're limited based on the mechanic of what we can do with station into this system. I, I would totally agree with you. I think the bone, the, the, the doctor that runs the bone lab would also agree with you that it is the speed of the muscle contracting and pulling on the bone that's going to have the greatest effect, mm. not just the, the compression loading. Right. Unfortunately, we're just not there yet. It would be great to be able to do Olympic lifting. And I think I mentioned earlier, as part of the new devices that we're looking at, one of the, our requirements, uh, mm. I do not want, we don't want to be limited in speed. We want to be able to move as fast as we want to, which hopefully will enable us to be able to do right. at least at the most do cleans mm -hmm. might not be able to do a clean and jerk might not be able to do snatches but we can at least do some type of a clean what yeah. about like being strapped with the harness being banded uh like plyometrics landing from jumps things like that like Can't deceleration that. is really high rate of force development okay. but you don't have any ability to yeah. like jump in and then land with the band or anything like that it'd be too the too, vi too, vi too well, vibrational or if any of these four corners bangs into any of the other corners then it's going to get registered as a bump that could be harmful because of the vibrations that it sends through the system as well as the, the parts of the hardware that are banging. So some of the stuff the Russians did would used to they would strap into the to the treadmill with the harness and they would do certain exercises on the treadmill. Mm. Well, when they used our treadmill, they tried to do the same thing that they would do on their treadmill. Well, our treadmill, as soon as they were on our treadmill, we were monitoring station, all that stopped. And some of that was twisting type of movements like hammer throw type of movements mm -hmm. bounding jumping squatting on the squatting on it that kind of, it, that that's mm -hmm. what this is for this is for running it was right. designed to run we don't we it'd be great to be able to do quote unquote a box jump engineering sort of. have our limits <laughs> to us you know on how and what we can do so we got to work uh, together with them yeah um so they're they're really telling us um kind of what speeds what loads we can take mm -hmm. and then we massage everything to be able to fit within those yeah. limits that they give us. So with this machine, it's for the most part a very sagittal plane yes. yeah. thing. There's no there's no transverse side to side or, or any rotational no. um, forces. Do you guys have any ability to, maybe not a minimum, just do you know, like static one arm holds or at least you're getting like some type of a, you know, a load side to side or any you loads could. rotationally you could, you, that, that are more... Basically what you could do, what you could, you, what you could do is as long as you're, as long as we did it from this plane, you'd stand in this plane and do it, right? Mm -hmm. So technically I could put the bar here and I could pick the bar up or I could do it with the cable and do the same thing and right. do that. Those are some of the things we, we, we have talked about uh, doing some things like that. Trying to look at one arm deadlift 
with the bar right. and doing it from that side and just seeing if that would add some more stability into the core and, it, it, and just for the low back and the issues that we have with the back from space flight. Yeah. So it's one of the things we have talked about. The key comes then is finding the correct crew member to try that in space to make sure that it would work and then it, it becomes, uh, if we wanted to change an exercise or to add an exercise that quote unquote is not approved, then I have to get engineering involved, we have to film it, so they'll have to coordinate filming it in orbit so that we can view everything, look at everything, make sure everything's monitored, make, you know, that nothing's good. And then engineering would come back sometime later after they've done their analysis mm -hmm. on the hardware and the video and say, that exercise is good to go, right? right? So it's not just as simple as saying, okay, yeah, we'll do that. Sure. But, and, and again, we, we, we can do that, but mm -hmm. it's also finding the correct crew member that we would put in that position and say right. that we would trust enough that we would want you to do it. Because right. not every crew member is advanced enough to do certain things. Right. We can teach them to squat and do things and do deadlifts, but there's only certain crew members I would have tried to do this, the thrusters with and the swings with until we knew that we could actually do them. Right. I wouldn't just throw, call the guy up that's up there now and say, or whoever, and we got three guys up there now, any one of them and say, hey, do this exercise. I feel comfortable enough for you doing this right now. No. If I've trained you in the gym, I'm okay with it. But if I've never trained you in the gym, I'm like, I don't want you doing it in space. I don't want you getting hurt. Basically, these guys are remote monitoring their athletes while they're in orbit on the space station. But it works just the same way as any other coaching relationship here on Earth. It's about the search for what works. Testing and retesting to see what stimuli result in the desired adaptations. But the body is, much like the International Space Station itself, a system of systems. It's all or nothing. I feel like we, we've covered a lot of topics. We've covered you know, bone density being probably the biggest one, and then muscle mass certainly follows that. And then we've talked about blood volume, we've talked about uh, hematocrit, we've talked about heart, we've talked about uh, ligaments, tendons, cartilage. We've talked about a lot of stuff today. Um, what about like nervous system or, or hormones? Um, a nervous system, that's a whole other issue. So um, one of the things with space flight is the inner ear. So you have the inner ear thing going on. So the nervous vestibular system is huge. Um, for us, post-flight, I think that's our biggest issue, wouldn't you say? I mean, our initially is just that the idea that you move your head down and you want to keep going, right? Or you lean back and you fall backwards. You know, we equate it to being, you remember when you were a kid and you used to spin around in the, the, the chair and then you stop and you get up and try to, that's kind of what it looks like, yeah. right? So your balance, so, all, so your balance is all messed up. Now, we don't know, we do, we do some testing here where they're looking at it, they actually put you on a platform and they move the floor out from under you and it measures, mm -hmm. it, can, it, can, it can differentiate between vestibular or proprioception so it can tell you one, which, which, which being effective more, which then in, hopefully enables us then to say, okay, we need to work more proprioception, we need to work more nerve vestibular, that kind of stuff. We, they do have a little bit of also in a perception and depth of perception uh, when they're coming back down, so talking a little bit with, with what you see and what you feel. Yeah. So they may, they may see, um, Know, kind of coming back from their spacecraft, they're going to touch something they think it's closer mm. to their hand than it actually is. So that's something that you see really at, as soon as they land, you know, that perception, that kind of motor sensory portion yeah. of it. Was that, was that because the, the blood volume was higher and they had that kind of intracranial pressure and it affected their vision and now their depth perception's all screwed up? We have a lot of uh, questions in that intracranial pressure right now mm. and to what really, how it's affected is it the, the um, ocular nerve that actually is going to be dealing with it or is it you know just the overall fluid that you have up there that creates that um, that intracranial pressure right now we're seeing some significant changes with the actual vision so they actually have seen um, uh, their vision decay as the mission progresses it's one of those big risks that we have right now and we didn't cover until about six years ago or so where crew members starting to come back from long duration Hey, I'm now using glasses, but at the same time, I'm older. I'm a year older, so I should be, you know, kind of. And, and then we have a big spike of, of somebody that came back and, and had a significant change, which is not normal. Start looking at it, uncover that. Uh, but it may be that uh, kind of working that issue have been uh, looking at many disciplines. So the fault tree for that one is it's pretty big. So we don't know how it's what the origin is and what we can do about it uh, in, you know, in reality of it. We're getting closer, we're, we're testing more with MRI right immediately after they land. Uh, we're doing other tests, you know, we, we, we do on the field, we land in, in Russia, so 
we put a couple tents, the helicopters get there, and uh, uh, the medical people are around to uh, uh, field test to, do, to measure all those perception and the ability to stand and how long can you stay up because of the low blood volume, we want to make sure that uh, you know, after coming back, do we have the right hardware inside uh, with you? Uh, you know, those G-suits that the pilots have, could we have something that would simulate that? and they're able to walk around, so orthostatic intolerance is a big deal. What about when guys come back? Not just to um, kind of get back physically, but um, I don't know if this happens or not, but do, do guys come back from a really intense mission that is very meaningful and it's like a life-changing event for them, and then they land back on Earth, and then all of a sudden, like this, this thing they've been preparing for for years, this, this peak experience is done, and now they're kind of like, well, fuck, what do I do next? And like, <laughs> it's kind of depressing in a way. It's like, it's almost like, a, you know, a dare I say more extreme than a woman that has a baby, like she has postpartum depression, she has this peak experience and then and then the hormones are down and, and she's not getting quite as much like, you know, you're about to have a baby, it's an exciting thing, and then all of a sudden she's just at home all by herself, like taking care of this baby all alone, and she runs into depression and hormones can get can get fixed in a way where it can kind of calm that depression. Does that happen with astronauts as well? They do get a big high after flying, so they, they're, they're, their whole life dream is to fly into space. They come back down, uh, yeah, they don't, I did it. I, I, you know, how long is it going to be until I fly again? So those type of questions they all get, out, they all get inside of them. So we've seen so definitely. Feeling, you know, they're, they're 24, 48 hours before, they're up in that tin can floating around, mm -hmm. and then they land. They're whisked off to Kazakhstan airstrip, and then taken to, you know, whatever plane that they're flying home in. 24 hours later, they're here at Johnson Space Center, mm -hmm. and meeting up with their family. Within 48 hours, we're talking, you know, up there, 40 hours or less, you know, and to being here, and maybe the next day going to their daughter's soccer game, and yeah. they're walking around well, looking. Well, yeah, and and they're looking around, and people are, you know, acting like they normally would act when they're at a, at a kid's soccer I, game, and you have an astronaut that's like, I cannot believe I was just up there, just a day and a half ago. I I, I would think that most of the guys I talk to, I mean, most of them are happy to get home. Yeah. After after six months, they, they pretty much, that's their, they, they think that's fairly good. Uh, they want to get home and see their family, especially if they have kids. They, they miss their kids. They want to see their kids. So they look forward to getting home. And then once they, get, and once they get home, it's just a whirlwind for a while. I think probably after about six, seven months of being home, it might, you might see some of that start setting in a little bit because for them to fly again, it might be, four, five, six, seven, eight years, or maybe not. Maybe that was their only flight. And then you just gotta, okay, I flew, I did it, I got accepted, now what am I gonna do, right? So, you don't know. But I mean, I you know, I think initially it's probably, they're, they're, they're just, they're ready to be home, you know, and see family and, and see everybody else and just get back to normal life, right? And they get to work with us. Yeah, and they get to work <laughs> with yeah. us. It yeah. sounds like another version of like, if you're a big time lifter, Let's say you go to the Olympics, you do good, you got the goal, and yeah. everything turned out. Uh, coming down from that and finding other ways to contribute to the sport you love. It seems like an astronaut could, you get a flight, and now it's like, well, I can be in the command so I can work with astronauts, I can educate, I can inform, yeah. I can help use my experience to, to maybe improve upon the methods, well, the procedures. Well, a lot of the guys that have flown, that have retired, I mean, they all went, they went to work for Boeing or to other companies, and they're working on help in development of the new rockets, you know, whether they've gone here or to out to SpaceX or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what they do. They're just still, they're contributing, they're just contributing in a different manner. I mean, a lot of them stay around and, a lot, and some of them do leave, you know, at some point, you know, they're just, they know, I'm done. I've flown, I'm done. I'd love to stay here and contribute, but if that offer came from one of the other places that want me to come out and help develop a new rocket or help do this, I'll, I'll go over there too. But I think it's more than normal. Yeah. They, uh, they say, I don't want to give this up yet. I don't yeah. want to be oh, switched yeah. into the management role. Yeah. I don't want to be told that I'm no good for the, the program anymore, yeah. right? It's, yeah. it's no different than Favre and anybody it's else that took their, <laughs> took their, their yeah. careers way into their that. older you know, years. Pro athletes, you know, you've been doing yeah. it. You don't want to give it up, you know? I mean, there's there's guys that have. I mean, one of my good friends. I mean, he was here almost nine years before he flew. He trained for nine, you know. So that's a long time. Now we had the accident in that in that time before that, right? Which kind of slowed that down a little bit because we didn't fly for almost two and a half years, right? So it slowed it down. It slowed it down a little bit, but because normally they would have they would have been flying within the, probably four years, and probably would have had multiple shuttle flights within that time, and you would have been you know been very happy with that. But to have one shuttle flight in nine years. You're like, you know, 
that's not kind of what he signed up. So yeah, it was a little bit, you know. But I mean, that's fine. You know, he flew to station. It's he's a lot he, more he, than most of the population. He's, had, yeah. he's, he's flown right. twice, and, and he looks at it. And he counts it as a blessing, and he'll tell you that every day. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 one of the most blessed people on the on the world. You know, you know. So yeah, yeah. And they truly are a very select group of people. But maybe one day we'll have the chance to look down to earth and see home from such a distance. If entrepreneurs like Richard Branson and Elon Musk have anything to do about it, we just may. Musk's SpaceX Dragon spacecraft already made history in 2012 when it became the first commercial spacecraft to deliver cargo to the ISS and safely return it back to Earth. And while it currently only carries cargo to space, it was designed from the very beginning to carry humans. With big new horizons laid out before us, space is beginning to look like the next frontier again, rather than our final barrier. Coming up, we head to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab and get to see some real-life astronauts going through their training paces. And Mike sets his sights on acquiring an extraterrestrial vehicle. This is wild. I want to take this thing to Burning Man. <laughs> Work outside the protective confines of the spacecraft is required. The astronauts up on the ISS have to perform an extravehicular activity, or EVA. This is more commonly known as a spacewalk. This feat takes the crew right into the void of space. And though they are still tethered to the station, they are essentially free floating, with only the feeling that they might at any moment fall back down to Earth. Preparing for an EVA requires strategic planning and intense ongoing training which we're about to see for ourselves right up close. First up though, meet Robonaut, the humanoid robot built to perform tasks that exceed the dexterity of a suited astronaut. This thing is designed to go where the risks to human life are just too great. There, the thought is that this will take their place in some of the astronaut spacewalk, and some, particularly some of the dangerous ones. The ammonia is one of the big huge things that uh, it's bad for the human. So taking Robonaut, um, and doing those, those dangerous tasks. They don't get tired, they don't get sick, they don't require you know, any of the uh, consumables that astronauts need, the oxygen and all that stuff. So the first phase is the upper body, and now the lower uh, phase where we would have those guys walk and, um, and be able to do actually planetary type walks. So that's right. what the team is working around. Robonaut is just one of the emerging technologies that will assist in EVAs for years and years to come. And with the moon and neighboring planets once again within our reach, astronauts will need tools and vehicles just like this as they begin exploration of these new, uncharted environments. Uh, go, this is a confined space as you see this, you know, there's a lot of us in here, but they'll sleep here, they'll eat here. We will have a, an uh, a exercise device, somewhat of an, a cycle ergometer, and some of the early thoughts was to use the cycle ergometer as power production. It's oh. not very efficient, but you can power up a computer. You get to pedal pretty hard just to light a regular light bulb, so it's not that much power, really. Yeah. Yeah. More efficiently, I think, would be uh, wind and sun. Yeah. And from this standpoint, yeah. if we're whatever how many miles are, uh, away from your your Mars base or your lunar base, you need you see something on the ground that you want to pick up because it's a really rain, uh, strange rock then you can go into the back of the of the vehicle, have some spacesuits ready and just jump into them without having to acclimate your body to the new environment, go out quicker and do more EVAs covering more terrain and then making it better of a science type of mission. This is wild. I want to take this thing to Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> we got to work on that. <laughs> All this aside, the primary piece of gear for any astronaut is their spacesuit. This is the only protection and life support to be found outside the space station itself. And we're about to get up close and personal with these bad boys. 
But first we have to travel to the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, NASA's testing ground for all EVA events. Located within the Sunny Carter Training Facility, the lab includes a pool that's close to 40 feet deep and holds approximately 6.2 million gallons of water. With full-scale mock-ups of ISS modules, this environment allows astronauts to move through a highly simulated spacewalk, including all of the appropriate bailout procedures should something ever go wrong. We're here to meet with Robert Knight, a suit and tool engineer that got his start at NASA way back in 1989. This is one of the guys that actually builds the Class 1 flight suits and the highly specialized instruments that astronauts handle during work and repair missions. As Robert says, it's definitely a dream job. He's here to explain exactly how training in the NBL takes place. But yes, this is, this is where they practice doing their runs over and over and over so they know it by the back of their hands. We typically do three to four what we call NBL events every week, whereas when we're flying shuttle days, uh, we, we're probably doing NBL events every day. We had uh, anywhere from two to four suits in on any given day. Uh, every time a crewman goes into the water, that crewman has four divers with him or her. Uh, you'll have two safety divers, you'll have a utility diver, and then you'll have a camera diver. So wherever that crewman goes, that camera follows them everywhere. And this is just one small process of what it takes nowadays to actually get up on station. Uh, everybody now who goes to station has to be EVA qualified. So you have to be able to function inside a suit. And again, it's just one small process of the, you know, the steps it takes to get to station. Yeah, but Neil was telling us how the demands of actually being inside that suit, I didn't realize, I guess that's pressurized, and just to move and do things that maybe look relatively simple. I guess you see spacewalks, you see movie depictions of it, where you see the, mo the motions look very pain. It's not so easy just to turn a wrench or turn a tool. I guess every moment of that takes intense focus and intense physical discipline to execute precisely. Absolutely. This is, uh, you're jumping into a suit that's pressurized to 4.3 PSI, so you're getting into basically a rigid suit, something that you have to acclimate yourself on how to properly use, and thus the pool. So once we put them in the suits, and we're actually using the suits they train in are actual spacesuits. The suits you'll see today, these are actual, real spacesuits. Uh, we just use them to train in the pool here so they can actually feel exactly what it's gonna be like as far as the interior of the suit. Now, in the water, of course, uh, simulating zero G by means of neutral buoyancy, you still have drag on the suit. You still have the zero G effects or the, the uh, uh, gravity effects on the suit here in the pool. Once they're in space, a lot of the feedback I get from them is it was much easier. <laughs> so, well, you got to train for the like train, make training really hard. So on competition day, right? On game day, on game day, it's not so hard. It's not so hard. So we we uh, we've seen women come through here that have trained and trained and trained. I I think one of the the, the one of the flights I'm most proud of is the STS-125 flight uh, where we captured the Hubble Space Telescope rebuilt it for the last time. We had four crewmen performing five EVAs, and those guys, uh, they trained almost three and a half years before they flew to perform that task. It was, it was something. It was, to this day, was, I don't want to take anything away from any of the other flights because I love all my, my crewmen, but these guys were, they were special. And uh, to this day, I still think that's one of the, the neatest flights I was a part of. But, the, the amount of effort it takes to, to get that mission done, and then the service that mission provides back to humanity and understanding of the universe, that's an unparalleled contribution to society. It's, it's hard to even get your mind around. It is. It, it takes is. that much discipline to make that happen. And you read a news story, oh, they got the, 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 the telescope up there. Cool. Hey, look, that, that galaxy was cool. Not knowing, Not knowing the sheer amount of work it took to make that happen. And it, these guys literally rebuilt a telescope in space. <laughs> it was just. You say it like that, it seems ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It, it, and I think when the idea first came up, they almost wanted to say it was impossible. But they did it. And this is where they trained for it. It's amazing to see all the preparation that goes into every training session and the amount of support required. There's literally hundreds of people involved in every rehearsal run, from technicians and medical teams ready divers monitoring training constantly from underwater. We actually have quite a few divers at work here. Matter of fact, over my shoulder, you'll see quite a few of them here. 
and they have dual roles. They're not just divers. Uh, we have uh, divers that are machinists, uh, audiovisual technicians, audiovisual engineers. I was gonna say, so these guys are part of your routine. Guys who like diving and are good with suits and all. Probably have a, a, a deep background that enables them to do a vast array of tasks. It seems like everybody must have the capability to, to wear many hats. To keep a facility like this up and running, we have to have uh, uh, an assortment of different backgrounds. And uh, believe me, they, they stay busy. They stay very busy. This is an incredibly impressive facility with attention paid to every detail. The exterior of the mock-ups look identical to the real space station modules. But what about the inside? How do you train for that environment? This facility uh, was mainly constructed to do everything outside of the space station. But there is one part of the space station that we have to actually perform some kind of training task inside, and that is our airlock. And I don't know if you gentlemen can notice, but there's actual handrails, the yellow handrails. Mm -hmm. That's actually a uh, hatch door that we can pull off the airlock just in case we have an emergency if the two crewmen are inside the airlock. Now when the crewmen go into the airlock, you've got one crewman with his head towards space station, and when the other crewman climbs in, his head is away from the space station. So they're pretty much head to foot while they're inside the airlock. Not a whole lot of room in, inside the airlock. So in this whole facility, that uh, the, all of the mock-ups inside the pool, that is the only one mock-up that they actually get inside. Everything else is extravehicular. We've covered the tools, the mock-ups, the systems crew, and protocols. Now there's just one last thing to discuss. It's what we've all been waiting for. The suits that we use are, are basically floater suits. These suits were not designed to walk in. Um, so other designs of suits are coming on board, and there's, there's, there's quite a few neat designs out there. So you're thinking of ways of reducing the impediments to movement and making it a little more fluid? Is that one of the developments? Yeah, it actually is, yes. We have, uh, there's a, a, a new suit des design out there that's, it's mainly all metal parts, bearings, hard shell, whereas the suit uh, you're gonna see today, our EMU, is mainly all soft goods. And so there's quite a few neat designs. And you guys are gonna have to go do your research to, to look at those suits, because we'll they're, they're pretty cool. <laughs> Okay. We'll do some research now. So how long do guys go out on, on a spacewalk where they're, they're in the suit the whole time? Like, do they have access to any type of like food or water while they're in the suit? If they're in, in a suit, like working hard for six or eight or ten hours? Or is that a realistic time domain? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Typically in EVA, we do an EVA six and a half, seven hours. Or yes, we do have a water bag that's inside of the spacesuit and we can fill that bag up with either 21 to 32 ounces of fluid, mm -hmm. uh, more or less water. Yeah. And the crewman has that for a hydration. That's our hydration system for the suit. Uh, not so much food inside the suit. Typically they'll eat prior to getting into the suit because they know they're gonna be in there for a while and they also know they're gonna be doing some strenuous activities. Yeah. So we, we want them to eat um, and hydration is important. So during the EVA or during a spacewalk, uh, they do have fluid that they can they can drink on keep yeah. stay hydrated. Do they take dumps in the suit? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, come on. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. America wants to. <laughs> That's kind of a serious question. Like at least can you go to the can you go to the bathroom? Can you at least like take a pee on it where you're in Absolutely. the suit for ten hours? You can yeah. pee all over the place. All over the place. When we get down in the lab I'll show you the garment that they wear to restrain their urine or bowel movements right, right. but yes you you can go to the restroom and see right. if you if you need to you can definitely go so uh, when but I was just uh, remember one thing yeah if you do take a dump in the suit you got to smell it <laughs> <laughs> the spacesuit was originally made for Alan Shepard's first historic space flight in 1961 and has since seen many developments and adaptations but while the material, color, design, and functionality all might change, the primary goal of this garment has always been to first and foremost protect the astronaut from external forces. Today's suit is white, to reflect heat from the sun which can rise to over 275 degrees Fahrenheit. The helmet even houses a gold line visor to protect astronaut eyes from the bright light of our home star. <laughs> this new Daft Punk helmet. Originally, the suits were all tailor-made for each individual yeah, cool astronaut, yeah, yeah. but nowadays, they're made to be one-size-fits-all. So, Look at this, guys. 
Oh boy. Look at it that. Won't fit on <laughs> Just not this size. Let's take a closer look at the current model, and some details on how the suits are actually built. This is called a 4.3 EMU. One of the easiest ways I can explain it is that the, the, the front of the suit right here, this whole area is called the DCM, Display and Control Module. The back of the suit here is called a PLSS, PLSS, Primary Life Support System. The simplest way I can explain this is this is its own spacecraft. Um, this would be the dashboard to the engine. Oh, wow. That's the best way I can explain it as far as simple terms. This actual module here controls all functions of the suit. Prior to performing the spacewalk, they will they'll don uh, undergarments, uh, liquid cooling ventilation garment, then they'll climb up in the suit. Once the suit is buttoned up, uh, from there we go to the O2 actuator. Uh, this is primarily the key to the suit, if you will. This is, this is how we get the suit started. Uh, you'll notice the front of the DCM most of the riding is backwards. So the crewman's head is, is fixed up here. Of course, you cannot see down here in front of the suit. So we actually install what we call wrist mirrors to each one of the wrists so that they can actually read all of this in the front of the suit. Wow. This round dial here is called a CCV, a cooling control valve. This is what uh, allows the water to flow over their body in their LCVG, their garment. Um, this switch here is called the O2 actuator. This is primarily how we press the suit. This is how we generate pressure in the suit. We have display and volume controls here for the intensity of the LCD readout and also the volume that goes to their ears and when they're talking out of their CCA. Um, when the suit is actually in the airlock space station, we can get all of our power through this port right here. This is what we call the SCU port, a service cooling umbilical. Uh, the service cooling umbilical supplies the air, water, communication, electricity to the suit, so that way we don't have to run off the battery power in the suit. Uh, once they're prior to going out of the hatch, they'll they'll switch a switch up here from from battery or from SCU to battery. Once they go to battery power, they'll disconnect this umbilical. They'll set it on the wall. They'll close this thermal cover here. Out the door they go. They're pretty much on their own. Out into the great unknown. And it's all because of this incredible piece of technology that they can survive out there. It really is an extraordinary life support machine. But before we wrap things up, there's still that important issue we raised earlier. How about the bathroom breaks? Here's your toilet. <laughs> so this is what you have to wear uh, prior to donning the LCBG and prior to get into the suit. Uh, we highly recommend that you wear one of these diapers. Um, <laughs> You don't want to be stuck inside of a suit for six to eight hours and have to hold it. That, that wouldn't be good. So we'll supply you with one of these. Uh, you're more than welcome to use it. You don't necessarily have to, but if you can hold it for that long, well, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> I've done it for a couple weeks. They're like, you know, I go every time. <laughs> it, 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 yeah. I, we've had a few that'll jump in the suits and no, I don't need it. And about midway through the run, they're like, uh-oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Like, what do you mean? What? What? First of all, in the space business, especially doing EVAs, we don't. There's a few terms we don't want to hear. We don't want to use. One of them is oh no. The other one is uh oh. And I can't say the other one on camera. Uh, but uh, can I say? <laughs> but there. But there are a few times that we've had crewmen say, you know, well, let me try this. Let, let me try it without it. And I'm always the guy going, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so. After about the first run, yeah, they start wearing it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, as soon as I went outside the spacecraft, I, I used my diaper, my soft space. <laughs> <laughs> I had my O blank moment. <laughs> With our time at NASA drawing to a close, we've got just one more thing to see, and that's a live training event in progress. For this EVA, astronauts Shannon Walker and Andrew Foistall are suiting up for entry into the pool. As you can see, a team of highly skilled individuals follow a detailed step-by-step -step protocol to ensure that each element of the suit is fixed in place securely and that the tools are all attached and visible. Once they're suited up, we have all the tools on them, all the facility weights. We'll use this crane right here. We'll hoist them up over the water and gently lower them into the water. Once they get just below the surface with their head, we'll start doing what we call an initial way out, kind of pull them out of the donning stand and, and see about where they're at. Are they too buoyant? Are they too negative? 
uh, kind of make some adjustments right here at pull side. And then after that, we take them over to what we call our down lines. You can barely see it, but there's a, a yellow float bag just under the surface of the water over there. Yeah. That's one of the down lines they'll be using to go all the way down to the bottom. Once we get down to the bottom pool, that's when we do our uh, final way out. We get them tweaked out to where they're perfectly neutrally buoyant with everything that's on them, their tools, their weights. After that, we, we start the event. Once the event begins, the whole thing is monitored from all angles. From the test director of the facility, to the top side trainers, coordinators, and the remainder of the station crew. Using a two-way communication system and a series of cameras, every decision is captured for safety and later analysis. It really is a privilege to witness this expertly choreographed event take place. There's been so much to see and learn here at NASA. And while we've tried to cover all the bases, there's simply not enough time to discuss all the exciting projects just on the horizon for Robert, Emil, and their teams. NASA's got some special things coming up. We've got, we've got trips going to Mars and, and, and deep space. And this is, we're, we're, it's like the 60s or whatever all over again. We get to see a moment in human history like the moon mission, but in our lifetime, we're gonna see a human on Mars. I'm hoping, I'm expecting, if we can all get behind it and support it, it will happen. It's amazing, it's beyond amazing the thought that this could become reality very soon. And of course, that your work is feeding into it. In this, right, right. Uh, it's hard to have words for that kind of scope of a dream, you know? It's something that uh, the public is starting to pay attention to. You know, it, it's, you know, when we're doing the moon, uh, the moon landings, uh, that was a big time in American history. It, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's kind of a shame that some people, I don't want to say forget about NASA, but it's not such big news anymore where you've got people risking their lives on daily basis. Every single day, right now, we have crewmen on space station that are risking their lives. And Just how much they're giving work-wise. Like, they're giving everything they can. They're perpetual grad students too, right? Their mind and body is working always to always. improve and to learn mm -hmm. and to push our mission forward constantly. At the very least we could do is say, hey, thanks for working to save society and humanity. And give us bright horizons to look forward to. Yeah. And I, I honestly think that we're gonna be back back there in that position. Um, with all of the neat things that, I mean, just the, all the kids that were getting involved in the NASA programs, all of the, uh, the programs we have out there in our high schools, we have the, the robotics programs or, and all the grants that NASA gives for, you know, students for technology. Uh, it's, it's slowly becoming uh, a wow factor with a lot of people, like, they're starting to pay more attention to NASA. What are we, what's coming up next? I mean, most of the things I've seen on TV, you know, especially about Mars and Moon and everything, they don't know the half of it. <laughs> Those are just the, the big selling points. You ought to see all the other cool things we do at NASA. So the work going on right now, especially with the technology that has come on board in the last 10 years, is, is unbelievable. NASA is reaching out not only into space, but to communities across the globe to help make this world a better place for all of humanity. Ground control to Major Tom. With such an amazing perspective on Earth, the example these astronauts set is something very important for everyone to see. When they look down to Earth, there's no boundaries, it's just Earth, water, um, and we all are in here together. So it's for the greatness of humanity, not for the greatness of any nation in particular. That context is powerful. Man. Yeah, it's working together. Where, where else do you see that? This is ground control to major tongue. Our desire to feel special is strong. For the likes of Copernicus, Newton and Einstein, we mostly held the Earth to be the very pivot point of our galaxy. That view has expanded greatly, but there is still a call to be more, something superhuman. Copy that, Bruce. Thank you. We've created a village in the skies, reaching beyond tribe and physical boundaries. Humanity is a complex and very special organism striving daily to advance, explore, and prove itself. But only in space will we grow past nation, color, and creed, and into a true community. That's our real potential. The heart of what makes us human.
I hope you enjoyed the show. Head over to Barbell Shrug on iTunes and check out our new exclusive show called Talking Depth, where the crew and I are going to nerd out on this week's episode and keep the conversation going.